here every Friday and there's about, I would say around 20 different presentations so far. If you take the address that's right there, the bit.ly, and I'll type that in, and then you do ELT, it is case sensitive, so you have to capitalize the ELT link, then you will find all the resources for all the presentations, and I'll be adding the recordings there as well. So the, then you can have all the resources. And you can always email me for a certificate. I'm behind in the certificates, but I'll get them to you as soon as I can. So what do you think about, and you can type this inside the chat box, when you think of nonverbal communication, what is nonverbal communication? So let's see what you all know about nonverbal communication. Now this, this is not the answers right here. This is just what nonverbal communication can teach our students. And then later on, we'll talk about what actually comprises nonverbal communication. But these are the things that it can teach our students, um, which is really important. It can t teach about intercultural communication because one of the things about intercultural communication is that different types of countries have different gestures that have different meanings. For example, when I was in Greece, uh, I lived in Greece for a little bit with Marissa Constantinidis. Uh, I was taking her salsa course, and one of the things about this that she warned me was that I couldn't have an open fist. So like, for example, if I wanted to give someone a high five, this would be considered quite offensive. My friend from Israel, I said, cross your fingers because I said, this, you know, to bring good luck. And he told me quickly, he said, no, we never cross our fingers here. So different cultures have different types of communication symbols. It has... Um, it's great for relationship building, and what I mean by relationship building is that it teaches your students how to develop relationships with the people around them, and this can be within their context uh, whenever they work somewhere, when they're in a business field especially. This is really important for them to understand this. This can really help them advance in their career if they know about nonverbal communication. It gives them context clues. What I mean by context clues is communication, uh, a lot of it has to deal with nonverbal communication. So sometimes we can't tell what a person's attitude or emotions are by their body language. So for example, if I, I always ask my students this one. So if I cross my hand, and so I ask my students, okay, pretend that you are lost in a different country. And you need to ask somebody directions in English. Okay, so the first person you see, you see their hands are crossed, and they're they're not making eye contact, and they're looking down. And then the second person you see has their hands open and smiles at you. So which person would you be? Would you be the first person that I showed A, or would you ask the second person that I showed B for directions? what your answers are. No, they're not universal, which is a really good question um, because you learn about intercultural communication. But, but some of them are. For example, smiles. Uh, smiles reach and travel through a lot of different communication channels in countries. So a smile pretty much means in the majority of countries that the person is happy, that the person is open, and that the person is nice, especially if the person makes eye contact at you and smiles. Now, it could also mean flirting in certain countries, so you have to watch out about that. But this is a good question. Um, hands crossed in the majority of countries do tend to mean that, you know, um, okay, that's really interesting. So what would it mean, Nina, in the Ukraine? And these are generalizations of many, many different countries. But see how already we're starting to talk about, um, how we're already starting to talk about different types, in just this webinar right here, different types of gestures and communication, uh, nonverbal communication in countries. So it really just helps you to talk about this. Um, it's really good for proximity rules. 
because then you can understand the difference between, for example, if I'm in Brazil, it tends to be a closer distance that people stay. So people can stay very close to you and stand closer to you than, for example, in other countries. Uh, yeah, zero distance. I mean, sometimes when they greet you, they'll just give you a big bear hug in some cases in Brazil. But in another country, such as, for example, Germany, in Germany, this wouldn't necessarily be the case. You would stand a little bit further back and you would have that distance, that comfortable distance. And if you try to go closer, then that makes the other person really uncomfortable. Um, it really helps for negotiation. And negotiation is one of those things, not only in the business field, but that we do every single day in life. For example, people, we often buy things and people try to sell us things. So it really just kind of helps us with negotiating and seeing if we can trust someone and, and also how to have this kind of a power play. And then it helps us build trust. It helps us to really see if the other person uh, can feel through our nonverbal communication that they can trust us. So these are some of the things that your students can learn. And then the, this will help them not only with the language, to be able to determine the language of the country, but it will also help you to, it will help your students to also be able to assimilate well in that country. So if, you're, if your student happens to travel, then your students will be able to assimilate better if they know the nonverbal cues and they know how um, to communicate nonverbally. So why teach? Okay, so I told you what nonverbal communication can teach your students, but why would we teach this? Well, some studies say that it's 60 to 93 percent nonverbal communication. That means that the majority, in mo uh, many, many experts and many, many scholars out there and also many different types of articles and research support that the majority of communication is nonverbal. So knowing this, it's really, really important for our students to be able to communicate, even if it's, you know, in any language. It's very important that they know the nonverbal. But, you know, they say this is a myth, but even if it's a myth, ourselves, we understand that nonverbal is a large part of communication. So, why teach nonverbal communication? Well, once again, it's access context clues, especially if, okay, so there's two types of context. You may be a teacher who teaches, probably the majority of us in this room teach one country, okay? So everybody's from the same culture, the same country. They grew up there. So many of us have these, um, these classes that are not mixed cultures or mixed backgrounds. If, if this is the case, then it's great for you to ask your students, well, what kind of nonverbal cues do we have? Because they'll already have the experience. They'll already know what a smile means in the country, what a thumbs up means, what a, a frown means, how to introduce each other. They'll already know this. But if you have students from different cultures, it makes it really, really interesting because then you get to compare and contrast um, what these different types of context uh, clues can mean. And this really helps them, just like when we're reading literature and text and we look for these clues of what the other person is saying, many times we can do that, we do this with nonverbal communication. We just don't realize that we do this. Um, it improves communication. If your student, if you yourself as a teacher, begin to understand the way your students communicate. So for example, I'm a non, uh, I'm a native speaker, but some of you are um, non-native speakers. You speak the original language of the students that you teach, and that's really good because you are ahead of me because um, I have to learn every, when I travel and I teach abroad and I teach different students from different countries, I have to learn their communication style. Um, and that's something that you already know. And so it really does improve communication. It opens your students to a whole entire world. Even if your students are in a monolingual situation, even if they are very much um, able to, to, to communicate with each other, they're going to be in their business field 
because they're learning English, they're going to interact with people around the world. So it's good to even now to get them to start thinking about intercultural communication and nonverbal communication cues from around the world because this will improve their communication in their job. Um, another thing is it helps them with professional growth. If, if your students are able to know negotiation and how to sell and how to have great presentation skills because their nonverbal supports their message, then your student will be able to get the raise, will be able to get advancement, will be able to sell things better than someone who doesn't know this. It improves your relationship with the student. Really young students who are very shy to talk. There's a certain type of nonverbal, even with beginner language students, that you will use with them that you won't use with adults. For example, one of the things that I do is I kneel down at the child's level when they're first meeting me and I shake their hand, um, but I won't grasp their hand like this and shake it hard. Now, with an adult, you would do that, but with a little kid, you wouldn't because you want to build that trust. So it really improves the student-teacher relationship if you understand the nonverbal as well. And then it's various levels. If you can communicate nonverbally, you can teach beginners. You can teach beginners um, much better than someone who doesn't understand the nonverbal communication. So what are the elements of nonverbal communication? There's much more than this. Does anybody understand proxemics? Does anyone know what haptics is or paralanguage? These are all parts of nonverbal communication. So you can put this in inside the chat box. I'd be very excited to see if anyone knows these terms. And there's there's more terms too. There's chronomics. Uh, chronomics. So this is only a, I think the most important part, but there's other parts as well. And this goes back to something that. Uh, I'm probably not pronouncing your name right, Grammy, but you, uh, that, that you had asked earlier uh, is whether non-communication can be voice and pitch and volume, and yes, that is con considered nonverbal communication. So what would be the vocal cues, like pitch and um, the slowness or speed of, of, of voice, um, the pauses, what would this be called? Of all these words on the board, which one is it? Is it proxemic? Is it uh, haptics? Is it paralanguage? It's paralanguage. We call this paralanguage. <laughs> um, so those are the vocal cues and things like that. Proxemics. This means distance. This is space. This is when you meet a person for the first time, how much space should you have between you? Um, another one is haptics. Haptics is touch. Sometimes uh, people will, this relates mostly not just touch, like um, uh, it, it relates to handshake. For example, if, if you're with an adult and you give them just your fingers when you're doing this, um, then this, this makes them feel uncomfortable and they can't trust you. But if you shake somebody's hand and you give a firm handshake, then they're able to trust you more. Another thing, if you switch it, if you let that person have the upper hand, if you just switch the palm very casually, then you have made that person trust you more. This is what experts say. So these are important things for your students to know, especially if they're like business English students, um, because these little these little tricks, yeah, um, will get them to, to, to do better in their business. And this will make you more valuable as a teacher. Posture. So if I slump down and I'm really quiet when I'm presenting and things like that. Oh, I'll actually share some videos about the physical cues um, later that you'll be able to reference in that um, in, in the list of links. But if I do that, Many presenters do this, and what happens is that people say, oh, they're not a good presenter, or they're not, or if, for example, that I don't look in the camera and I look away, then people may not trust me because I can't make eye contact. But all of a sudden, I, I put my shoulders up, I make eye contact, I open my body, my hands, and my gestures towards you, 
I smile, I make eye contact, um, all of these, and I make my vocal range louder and slower and talk, then all of a sudden, I'm a great presenter. You see how this really helps with presentation, and your students will have to know this as well. When students are learning a language, it's very important that they understand that the nonverbal communication um, will really impact the way people understand them. So for example, many of our students, even me, when I speak German, I tend to get a little shy. I say sorry a lot of times. And sometimes I don't want to make eye gesture. But when I, I'm very confident about it and I just don't worry about the other stuff and my body language shows that I'm very comfortable and confident, then, then I'm able to have longer conversations. I'm able to meet people in and I'm able to speak actually better German because it goes back and forth. And many of our students will tend to be the opposite. So it, it really is empowering for our students. But how do we introduce this? Okay, so I'll get to the fun part, the very practical part, how you can actually put this in your classroom. One of the things that I always do with my students is in the beginning, because I think nonverbal communication is very important to communication. So one of our first lessons is we go to a public place I put them in pairs, and each of them observes, they decide to observe any couple or anybody having a conversation. Um, they, they observe just their nonverbal. So I give them a list of the nonverbal, the vocal cues, the, um, the, the everything that I just gave you, the parallel language, the haptics, the proximity, just a list. And each of them writes an observation of of each of this. They say, did they make contact? What they think that the person, the two people are having a conversation about, if they're angry, if they're fighting. And so each of these pairs um, are observing the same conversation. It could be a group conversation. It could be whatever they think. Um, and, and then they just write it down. And then in the classroom, they compare notes and they see if both of them had the same observations. And if they both understood what the context and what the conversation was. So yes, so your students observe these in public places and then they share with the class. So after they compare notes, then they share with the class. And then you'll find that many of them will actually find that they came up with the same types of observations, the same kind of context clues, gave them an idea of the body language. But when they do this, they begin to open their eyes and they begin to see how they can determine different types of conversations and stuff just by the body language. And this is much more powerful than them reading this out of a book. If you heard something like haptics or paralanguage, you'd just be like, well, I'm not really sure if I can remember all of that. But if you, if you actually apply this, then you'll be able to remember it better. One of the fair things that you can do is show videos. There's so many fantastic videos out there um, about this, it, uh, this topic. And, and they're so interesting. Students really get into the videos. I'm going to show you one of the videos that I have shared with my students. And this one is on negotiation. And this is really good for, for business English students. But even Have you ever come across two people sitting together, exhibiting the same physical posture, deeply engrossed in conversation? You don't have to overhear what they're saying to know that they're in total rapport. I'm Carol Kinsey-Goman, author of The Nonverbal Advantage, and I'm talking about mirroring. When a colleague mirrors your body language, it's his way of nonverbally saying that he likes or agrees with you. When done with intent, Mirroring can be an important part of developing business relationships and building rapport. Here's how it works. Mirroring starts by observing a person's body posture, then subtly letting your body reflect her position. If her hand or arm is on the table, wait four or five seconds, then place your hand or arm there too. If she smiles or leans forward, you do the same. You can adjust your vocal tone, volume, or rate of speech to be more like the other person's. 
When a person is closed off or resistant, the easiest way to increase her comfort level is to use mirroring. Just be careful not to mirror highly negative postures such as both arms and legs crossed or an upper body that's turned away. In business situations, you know that you've developed mutual rapport when your partner begins to mirror you in return. Body language often reflects feelings and attitudes. So when you're mimicking another person's posture, you actually begin to understand more about him. And that can be the basis for real rapport. Mirroring is useful with clients, sales prospects, customers, and coworkers. It's a silent signal that you're positively relating to the other person. Try it out for yourself. So did you think that your, I'm going to unpause now. Okay, so did you think, is this something that you would be able to show your students and would they be interested in this? Um, I, I think every time I've, sh I've shared this, they really are interested in this. Um, and that's one of the things that, um, ah, where did that, okay, so attractive presentation. Um, but then there's many videos that are like this. Um, and, and you can show this with captions and, and you can let them play back. It's only two minutes. Yeah, probably with adults, but even college students, even teenagers, because guess what they get to do after they see this video? Role play, they get to try the mirroring themselves. And then they have such a fun time because they both know that they're mirroring. So this isn't a real typical situation. But they have such a fun time trying to mirror each other. Um, and, and then they talk about this in a class. <laughs> yeah, you can motivate teams in different ways. Or you not, not only as a building a relationship with, you know, a, a girl or a boy, but if you told teens, hey, if you mirror to your parents, you could get stuff like drive the car this weekend and stuff then your, your teenagers would be really excited about this as well to understand this kind of language. But there are different techniques like this that they show. Even if your students disagree, this is still conversation. And then they have to explain why they disagree, why they think this technique wouldn't work. Um, and there's definitely things that you would talk about when you talk about these different techniques, you introduce these nonverbal techniques. So that's just one of them, the, the, um, the mirroring. Um, but, but there are other things as well. And when you start to, when you're starting, your students start to try these techniques, they'll see that this is actually something they have to develop. This is something they have to practice over a long time, which is why the next lesson with their homework is, so instead of giving them a worksheet or anything about oh, let's match the paralanguage to the vocal cues or gap fill or anything like that. We don't do that. Instead, what I have them do is I say for a week, what I want you to do is keep a journal, and I want you to try these nonverbal communication things that we talked about, and then I want you to document the reaction from somebody who doesn't know that you're doing this. So to change things a bit, to try the mirroring, to try the smiling, to try the little hand thing that I talked about, the handshake that I talked about, and then for them to write down their experiences trying out these different types of nonverbal communication skills. So um, I think this way it makes it more personalized. And then you can also see how it impacts uh, relationships with people around them. So for your teenagers, you could have them try this type of mirroring and see if they really did get their parents to give them the car in the weekend or to increase their allowance. And this would be a fun topic that they would enjoy talking about. Um, so these are, these are some of the things that I have learned when I was doing nonverbal communication. Um, and, and another thing I want to point out that I didn't put on here is that it really, really helps your students with presentation skills as well. So if 
a majority of your students will have to at some time give a presentation, whether they're going to give a presentation in class or for the business field and stuff. So they'll really have to understand how to control their gestures, how to really um, use their hand gestures, their voice, their vocals, their timing, their face, and different things like this, their eye contact, to be able to tell whether, to be able to persuade their audiences, and to be able to communicate the language. And I think at the end of the day, when you teach a language, the most, one of the most important things for your students, for them, that they want to be able to do is they want to be able to communicate their message to the other person that they're talking with. So the nonverbal, if it supports this, will really, really help them to get this, um, at, to, to reach this goal. So does anybody have any questions for me? You're more than welcome to get on the microphone and ask. Okay, so um, I, Michael, I think you have the mic. Let me make sure I gave. Hello. Uh, okay. Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah. Oh, well, actually, I would like to thank you. There, this is great. A great uh, presentation on using nonverbal inside the classroom. <clears throat> well, of course, uh, I think that what what is uh, verbal or nonverbal is the kind of communication that we need a real communication between a teacher and the students but we need more focus between the students themselves because we want to get them involved into the um, I mean nonverbal non communication well actually I, I think that nonverbal is a is a global thing that it's uh, as I said that it's intercultural thing but we need to focus on the meanings of such nonverbal things like um, the meaning of eye contact, the crossing the, the legs or whatever, that students should be, I mean, uh, a careful and whether, I think that sometimes we can use it in, in Jordan, but we cannot use it in, uh, maybe it means something else, and uh, maybe negative in another country, that this is, we, we should, yeah, I think that we should be careful about this. Uh, I, I think even though nothing the, the head, uh, I mean, in India it means, Different different things. I don't know. This is what I got an idea about. Nothing the head. Maybe you said it, it means no, but sometimes sometimes it means yes. Well, well, actually, um, what, one more thing about I want to say about nonverbal using nonverbal and in, in teaching English or whatever. I think for me, I can I can use it for error correction, and this is very important for the students as a kind of feedback. So sometimes, really, I, sometimes I try, I try to use my, my fingers uh, to spot, to tell the student that, uh, or sometimes I ask the students to, to use their fingers to say that there is a, um, uh, an error or mistake in the sentence, whatever it is. For example, if I said that I, I live, I live in, I live, I live Germany, so I need something, uh, so I try to use four fingers and tell them that. I live and something missing here, so you have to say something small that you have to know that in, for example, Germany. So this is very important. Sometimes you use um, hands, um, movements, facial expressions. Uh, I think that. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Just what, what I want to say. Thanks a lot. So I leave the mic for you. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's fantastic that you brought up uh, correction because I didn't even think of the error correction. But you're so right because, for example, if they make a mistake, well, like the the I understand what you mean about the error correction with the finger, and then you say I live um, at um, or I live on Germany. Then you would you know use this one so they know that that's the wrong word and they can correct it or in the past, um, so they know that it's a past tense. 
our future. So yes, error correction, that, that's fantastic. I didn't even think about that. But yeah, that, that's really important. Um, and I think you bring up a good thing about, which I think is great, that in some countries, different types of gestures mean different things, like the nod that you said. And so this is really important for students to start to understand, even at young ages, because that way they're more open when they're in their, bis in their field and they have to communicate with people around the world because this is the way the world is now. It's a very globalized world and we have to communicate with people around the world. And part of respect is understanding their nonverbal communication. So if our students learn this already in our classrooms, then we really provide them a great opportunity that we were never really taught. Um, that, you know, how to really communicate with the culture by respecting them non-verbally. So, for example, even clothing is considered non-verbal communication. So, in some countries, I wouldn't wear something like this. I would wear, you know, a head cover or I'd be very respectful. And, and I think that, you know, non-verbal communication when we, is just such a great topic to be able to teach these things to our students. Uh, does anybody else want to say? Uh, thank, thank you so much, Paizo, for bringing that up. Those were really great points. Anyone else have any techniques they use? I think the recording that Elizabeth Ann was talking about is, is really a great idea. Uh, because, yes, you know, this way our students, maybe we say something in an observation during feedback. We say, oh, you paced around too much. Or you rock back and forth on your, on your knees when you present or you do, you know, when they, we tell them something, they don't realize it as much as when you see yourself in video do this, then it's like a shock. You really try to correct things. Um, that's a, a lot of ways that I learned presentation skills was I saw myself on video and I thought, oh no, I can't believe I do that. So yeah, I think that's a really great idea. Any more questions? I think that's a very good point um, about the teachers. Yes, Trevor said that the teachers are disrespectful when they hand out material. One of the things about teaching nonverbal communication is that it really helps me to think about my nonverbal communication with my students. And things such as having a smile, um, I have seen really improves the mood of my students. It makes them happier, it makes them really warm up to me, especially teaching young learners then there are different types of nonverbal communication skills that I use. And it has really helped with behavior problems. Because when I come up to a kid and I sit at their level, and I narrow at their level and I talk with them, maybe in, sometimes I'll put like a hand on their shoulder or something. Or I can read their language, their body language. And if they're really angry and it looks like, OK, I need to just leave them alone for a little while, then that's what I'll do. But their nonverbal communication really, really helps me to judge their behavior and I can calm them down and I don't have to do something drastic or it doesn't escalate. But I've noticed that when I'm angry or if I act really mean or, or angry towards something a student did, it escalates. It makes the situation explode. So I think that really, really is a good point too. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. We, we have to see what, what kind of things we can do. I know in, in one school, I wasn't allowed to hug any of the students. I was only allowed to like pat their head. But in another country, like you said, you can't place a hand on a child's head. Yes, a new, okay, so Ming Khan says newborn infant communicates without words and will require nonverbal communication. That's very true. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's, there's so many rules uh, about contact with, um, with students, so we do have to watch out with that. That is, that is something we have to be careful of.
even with proximity levels, um, the space, the space we have between our students. I think it's really important, especially if, for example, you know, I, I'm a girl and I teach, I, I have to, those are things that I think of too, you know, um, that I don't stand too close or something. And um, I, I have to be careful uh, with teenagers and things like that. I, I do try to a respectful distance and so the nonverbal communication has really helped as a teacher as well, I think. But thank you all so much. I'm going to go ahead and give you the, the bit.ly there. It's for every single resource. I'm collecting them for all the presentations. 